Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to part three of this webinar series. Um, today is a historical perspective and rationale behind the Hereska Alternating Reciprocal Rotation Test. Um, and just as a reminder, then the uh, handouts are posted on our website on the webinars page that correspond with this webinar and um, so that you can follow along if you have not found them already. But thank you again for joining us. Thanks for your presence and your attendance. Uh, we both, Jen and I both appreciate you being here. And uh, for the future listeners, uh, we hope that the next, I don't know, hour or so will uh, generate some interest in this uh, uh, so important part of our body, the, the back side of our body that we sit on and we hit when we walk. And uh, and the 40 years, the 40 plus years that preceded this, I, we just uh, today did a, a, a privy on similar subject matter. And uh, this goes back to the uh, to the fabric of how I got where I'm at today with when I look at people who are struggling with alternation and sense of themselves as it relates to reciprocal cycles. So this this test has been around, and um, I uh, I was looking for someone out there in, in my past that would uh, uh, do exactly what this testing does, and and would put a test together together like this to help us understand uh, when to intervene, how to intervene, when to assess, and how to assess those who are having problems with uh, uh, dynamic stabilization. So it's a test used as a thoracic pelvis abdominal dynamic uh, measurement with each grade reflecting muscle position, uh, strength, kinesthetic awareness, and the neuromuscular ability to move one's self forward through an, and through antiphasic interlimb movement. So it's an interlimb, uh, it's an interlimb representation of what you can cortically sense and cortically, cortically can uh, can do uh, with this with this ongoing alternation that these two sites of our body provide us. It's a good test in my mind or activity to consider when questions arise regarding upright thoracic pelvis integration secondary to extremity phasic activity and sensory processing of associated supportive sense. Uh, alternation of our spinal rotation through the use of contralateral hip flexors with concomitant unilateral hip extensors requires appropriate abdominal integration and appropriate timing of upper extremity reciprocal flexion and extension. So a uh, representation of what we do with our upper limbs and our upper extremities uh, can be found on the activity or the, the recognition of what your two ischial seats and your two, uh, two calcaneal uh, posterior tuberosities are actually going through and sensing and are being sensed by your your brain. Uh, I, I'm going to hopefully cover all this. It's all in your manual. It's all in the uh, material that Jen forwarded to you. Uh, but I'm going to highlight through this webinar the following things that I think about and relate to when I, when I use this test or when I use these principles of this test. These are the things that are outlined in this webinar. And we're going to, you know, we can spend a great deal of time on any one of these, uh, as well as all of them. But I'm just gonna give you the highlights as they relate to, I think what the interest might be when they, li of anybody listening to this webinar, and that are the following. One, you know, what postural pivotal points do for us? Uh, what, what is the optor foramen regulating? And how does the optor foramen regulation of foramen magnum, your, your, your brainstem, uh, work together? Where are they located and how do they work together? This level three and level five uh, 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 activity uh, are followed up in this manual with recommendations that I'm gonna give all of you if you have a problem with actually uh, ascertaining whether or not you can do level three and level five. And furthermore, what would you do if you cannot perform them, perform them correctly? We talk a little bit about tensegrity and I love talking about tensegrity as it relates to tension that's associated with the long seated position. Uh, we're gonna talk about long seated, long 
floor implications on the uh, ontogenetic development of upright body memory, memory of, of how uh, we were developed without you know, consideration made at times in our life when consideration should be made on how we got there with that memory of, of, of uh, holding ourselves up and holding the mass in the position we want. Uh, we're going to talk pressure uh, pressure offloading. Jan, this is a big one, as you mentioned this morning. Pressure offloading and arm reaching. It's it's synonymous with each other. When you reach, uh, you're offloading. And the sense that's associated with that arm reach and their pressure offloading is a one-to-one -one sense. It's a, it's a hemispheric uh, consideration, and it's real. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not even thought. Uh, Theoretical, uh, it's real. Hypothetical activity exists around these regions, but this is a real, real in time uh, consideration that should be made. The pressure of getting away from something as it relates to how you reach with your arms. Uh, Mid-brain limb control during reaching movement. We're gonna talk somewhat about that. Again, I wish we had more time to talk more about it. Uh, it's, we reference this in courses like uh, cranial, cervical, but midbrain activity and, and the reaching movement that the midbrain is responsible for as it relates to limbic, the, the limbic system, and yes, even the limbs themselves. So suggestions for how you can get people to long seat better, how people should at least appreciate that position, and how to get people to understand the significance of of, of the orientation they have when they're in that position. So those are the things that I hope that we cover in this webinar, at least on paper. Uh, and we'll take some questions, I understand, Jen, at the very end, if you have any. So the human postural pivotal points of our body, of our upright body, are the ischial tuberosities and the calcaneus tuberosities. They provide our brain and our body the ability to sense pivoting. Uh, for those, for the vestibular and visual system, synaptic network. It's a synaptic discussion during orientation of the lateral position of our center of mass. Uh, our mass centering, our centric what activity, wherever it may be in your body, it's probably not ever going to be symmetrical positioned. But wherever it may be in your body, that sense is definitely going to have a provision of, of orientation gained from your two ischial seats and your two heels. This network and associated cortical map allow us to alternate our bodies for, for, for advancement of each side of our body, advancement of each side of our body, and acceptance of gravity of each side of our ground. So each side of our body and each side of our ground communicate through these two sites, and they're independent of the, each other. And danger, uh, dangerous situations occur when they are not independent of each other. Our primary cortical areas of our brain, our motor sensory and visual areas of our brain are derived from hemipelvis, hemithorax, and hemicranial function from this interconnectivity, this interconnected communication between the, he the heels, the ischial seats, and the heterodistal middle fingers. So we have this activity that's generated synaptically through synapse of you know, EEG activity, frequency activity that is communicated uh, to and from sites of the hand, the heels, and your sit bones. And so for those of you not really uh, familiar with these areas, uh, uh, this particular part of your body, the ischial seat down this region, uh, along with the, this foramen, uh, this obturator foramen region, is a highly vestibular part of our body. It's a high vestibular component of our body, as is uh, this thing called the calcaneus. So this is the, you know, the, one doesn't trump the other. This is communicating with the aforementioned anatomy, and the aforementioned anatomy is communicating with that, that prominence, that, that, that back and undersurface of that bone called the calcaneus. And then we shouldn't forget about the importance of our middle finger, our axial activity, our rotation, our pronation, our supination, our radiuses and our ulnas uh, are all following the things that are going on the, in the lower part of our body through uh, tibia and fibular rotation. 
those bones are all regulated by how well you're synchronized with the the tuberosities that are responsible for your body moving forward or backwards, up or down, side to side. Uh, all three have an axial component that are responsible for that rotation. So you can see here's the same diagram, but that sense of rotation around that axis is critical for your vestibular memory, as is this rotation, this subtalus rotation axis, which is really calcaneal, which is really uh, an obturator foramen, a foramen magnum. That subtalar axis is responsible for vestibular flow and for vestibular freedom, as is this part of your body, this axial sense of what your little finger and your thumb are doing around pattern rotation. And pattern rotation exists with every cyclical movement you make with your act with your protuberances and your 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 tuberosities of your sit bones and your heels. Those are all interconnected. Uh, a lot of research on that. Our primary axial cortical function is developed by rotational therefore use. We were made to pivot. And when you say the word pivot as a reference site, as a contact area, you have to think rotation. The function of pivot is called rotation. Uh, it's reflexive and it's associated with cortical and subcortical synaptic mapping. And that synaptic map mapping has patterns of frequency associated with it. Your frequency in your brain is developed off of that rotational reflexive contact by ischial contact and heel contact. Every time you touch something with your hand, the middle part of your hand is the representation of how you did so. What you sense comes from that orientation of memory associated with that rotation around a, around a mid-axial component of your upper limb. Our center of mass or our partial replacement our partial placements organized around these thresholds of synchronous, synchronized waves in the brain that are patterned off of networks of synaptic activity through this neurotransmission frequency that is activated and simulated at the cortex when you change, challenge, or design shapes uh, through those axes for map synchronization behavior. Our behavior is built off of function that allows us to freely move with rotary mindedness. And that's a big slide and I, I, I just heard what I said and I can't tell you how I'm excited about talking about this concept, these concepts as it relates to two areas of the body that this institute really reflects highly on. Our brain discriminates different frequencies of electrical waves through synaptic plasticity that allows neural transmission of connections to change with experience and memory provided by those sites of contact, initial contact. This synchronized mapping is built around oscill oscill oscillatory or oscillation and pendular forces and frequencies that are designed around acceptable aligned upright positional states of control and physiological states of respiration as our body shifts from side to side. Uh, our pivoting function is pivotal. Mechanical pivotal function really starts with the pelvis inclination on the acetabulum, pelvic floor, res and pelvic floor respiration, and the internal rotation of the ilium on the sacrum and the anterior inlet. That's where our pivoting activity really begins. Our cortices are built off of that function. We were designed as upright human mammals because of that function. It's a very important concept when you start looking at postural management, uh, physiological management, and most importantly, psychological drain on you. The pelvis moves on and over these two femoral heads that also move on and over two calcaneal bones. The need to keep the one end of the leg rotating opposite to the direction of the other end is totally dependent on the cortical recognition of both that are movement, both of the, of both the, of, of both the movement itself. So in other words, the movement itself has a representation of movement occurring on two sides of the body and that cortical function is related to 
memory built off of lateral direction that is providing body. So how you move simultaneously from one end to the other with two sides of the body is how memory, synaptic memory is laid down. For example, if the distal leg is moving inwardly, that would be internal rotation, the proximal leg would need to move outwardly as the center of mass shifts over to that right side. Hopefully the distal leg on the other side would be moving outwardly or externally, and the proximal leg would be moving inwardly as the center of mass remains over to the right side. Now it's complex, but when you break it down, it simply looks like this. It simply looks like someone who's um, flexed their body in a squat-like position and are, is moving from side to side. So if you look at this young lady, as she moves her trunk to the right, She's shifting her hip to the right, but she's also doing things with her upper and lower extremities with those axes I went over earlier to allow her to do that. Her brain cannot allow her to do that if, she, if her brain doesn't know what the two posterior tuberosities on, the, on the, both the heels, the calcaneus bone, and the ischems, the pelvis bones, are working, how they're working at the same time. That bilateralism is a memory. It is a patterned memory. You really can't move this leg without that brain doing something on the other leg indiscreetly. I don't have to say a word, it's gonna be done. You don't have to be upright, you can be in a bed and you can do it. So your brain knows when your body does that kind of activity on one side, the center of mass, the center of your axis will shift. And when that center of axis shift, your brainstem and the frame and magnum and the obturators in your body know it, which means the brain now is helping you immediately within milliseconds to complement that activity through the other sides, tuberosities, pivotal points. So pivoting does not happen on one side ever in the body. Pivot is a bipivotal issue. You have head bones with little condyles that pivot together. You have shoulders that pivot together. Uh, you have thoraxes that pivot together for both. So that pivotal activity is axial. When you say the word axial, you say rotation. When you say rotation, there is a functional, dynamic, bilateral, synergistic, pivotal pattern occurring that is cortical. You cannot separate it. The only way you could is you'd have to do something hemispherically to do, to do that. You'd have to reduce oxygen to that side of the brain. So I really think this is an important slide. This ability to shift from side to side can only occur when your body is going through a squat-like maneuver. When you're upright, your bilateral activity to shift is diminished or uh, impossible because the overextension takes away the ability to shift your center of mass. And if you can't shift your center of mass from side to side, your axial pivotal point of that reference activity for your memory and your cortices is now reduced. You can resense all you want, but the body is locked up. And so this is why this is such an important deal to me to get people to understand one leg has to be loaded while the other one is offloaded. One arm is gonna be loaded through a thorax while the other one is offloaded through the thorax, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's called frequencies. And uh, it's a really important concept. And I still don't think today a lot of people understand that. Uh, well, you don't move forward uh, by, by staying erect. You move forward by you know, non-erection. So when you look at lateral movement of the trunk, it's an essential requirement for balanced sacral base activity because it supports the spine. An axial rotation around the subtalar axis and the middle phalanx of the hand predicts and precedes this lateral massive shift with a change in direction of the trunk and abdomen, mechanically occurring through the lower extremities. The pivotal points below the obturator foramen, the ischial tuberosities and the calcaneal tuberosities provide the body that owns these sites the freedom to move or rotate around a dynamic set of bones, 
a bone point of surface contact with the world that is responsible for structural foundational behavioral support. So that interconnectivity, that interrelation, that intercession, if you will, that intercedes the ability for you to move is really built around foundational behavior of support, but that foundational behavioral support is pivotal. So we've had this diagram or this illustration in our institute for many, I wanna say three decades now. And again, the point is, this is, this is pivotal support. One is going up while one is going down. So somewhere that innominant set of bones can work in unison with each other cyclically in the opposite flow of direction. That flow of direction that you're seeing at innominates and the spine itself has to begin with pivotal pressure points. And the pivotal pressure point we all were made off of, we all developed from, was our ischial seats. And the ischial seats have a beautiful hole above it called an obturator, um, uh, obturator foramen, which we'll show you a better picture of here in a few minutes. The relationship between these two sites and this site called the uh, calcaneal bone is one to one. You have an ischial seat in the calcaneus on this side, and you have another ischial seat on the other side. So you have four prominent areas to help your hand uh, stay loose, to help the tension in your neck to stay reduced. That pivotal activity, if they're not communicating correctly, and there's a synergistic lag, your neck will tense up and your hands will tense up. You will clench, you will chew, you will grind, and you will stay anxious. So basically you're looking at something that's been in this institute for years, but I'm not quite sure until today, looking at from these eyes of these different parameters, it's ever really looked at as cortical structure. Without the seat or ground surface sense, we would reroute brain synaptic electrical flow to engage plantar flexors, back extensors, and in general, the autonomic nervous system itself to adapt to gravitational demands. A number of soft tissue structures attached to the ischial tuberosity, a number of them do. The sacral tuberous ligament, some gluteal muscles, both the inferior gemellus and the quadratus femoris are, are two. The adductor magnus and the posterior thigh muscles, uh, your biceps, your semitendi, semimembri, hamstring muscles, all attached to this area. And the foundation for this institute started there because we were muscle people. But the foundation didn't, didn't really generate function by those muscles without the pivotal role these pivotal sites serve cortical function. So we've had this illustration in the past. I'm just pulling it out. And we're showing you the two sides of that ischial seat, the front and the back. So when you look at the back here, you've got that group of muscles and that soft tissue. And then when you look at the front, you have another group, these adductors and this other soft tissue. This, the role that these muscles play are not providing the provision of sense of, of orientation. It's the other way around. The orientation that these, this ischial pivotal site, that it, the orientation of this ischial site will direct the functional activity of the muscle and the ligaments and the soft tissue that's attached to it. Uh, muscles don't stay weak or strong or tight or loose because of, because of, of inf, uh, input from the brain by, by saying, I want to lift, I want to push. Muscle tension is regulated by pivotal site orientation to contralateral pivotal site of orientation. So if you aren't in the right position when you move your body and both of those ischial sites and both of those, those tuberosities of the calcaneus are not cyclical, not alternating, muscles become either overused or dropped off. It has nothing to do with the muscle. It has everything to do with the attachment sites. And I've been speaking about attachment sites all my life and the number one attachment site, and we've talked a lot about calcaneal attachment sites, but the number one attachment site for our operative activity with the sensory motor cortex begins with your ischial seats. 
because we're upright creatures standing in gravitational fields of flow that require, require alternation of mass. These muscles pull on the ischial tuberosity and posteriorly rotate the bones that are responsible for pushing the anterior spine upward. And I said that correctly, pushing the anterior spine upward. Those pivotal points are responsible for lifting the anterior spine upwards, thus decreasing the demands on the muscle that attaches to the anterior femur and the lower spine that is used for forward de uh, declination of the lowest spinal sp segment to stay centered on the forwardly tipped sacrum. It's not a bad thing to have a forwardly tipped sacrum. It's a tremendous difficult thing to manage if it stays there. So I just took these pictures just the other day and I'm, I'm just with RJ's help and you can see this picture from behind. This is a picture of a long seated uh, individual and these two ischial seats represent how those bones are gonna lay in front of that, that, that body. And they don't look at the orientation of the spine so much, but look at the levelness of those ischial seats. That is called vestibular. That is more vestibular than your visual system. I'll say it again. That is more vestibular for postural management than your visual system. Your visual system is run off that position. Your visual system is represented, you choose one or the other to stand on. Your visual system is interpreted by how you made sense of that pivotal point. Your extraocular muscles do not operate with input coming from those two sides. We'll talk about that later this year. The second slide is showing you an individual that's got their legs out in front of them. And the camera lens was on the inlet of that pelvis. But that pelvis is anteriorly rotated. Wait, we didn't even show you the ischial seats. We know it's pelvically rotated because both of the femurs are inwardly oriented. And when those femurs are inwardly oriented, this individual does not have good representation of the ischial seats. There is nothing you're going to do with this lower limb, these lower limbs until you get a better, at, better disposition about those two ischial seats. Um, and this is where the magic kicks in for the cranial system. All the cranial system wants to feel is tensegrity of tension. Tensegrity of tension is not on or off. Tensegrity of tension is alternating. And that alternation begins with a mind that's saying, my responsibility to this body is to make sure that these two bones, even when I'm sitting, can offload. I'm going to use one, use one ischial seat to offload the other. And if you don't figure out how to offload one of those ischial seats, and you're loading them both, you're not only loading them both with internalization con over convergence, you're loading them both with a, with a system that can't breathe. It's impossible because your diaphragm now is part of your anterior spine. You have no way of lifting your anterior spine other than taking a deep breath in and holding it. You've replaced your di you replaced the anterior spine with a diaphragm. So again, go back to the former slides I showed you. The responsibility of your ischial seats is to reduce the load on the diaphragm. When the uh, obturator foramens are positioned by in range of femoral flexion, 90 degrees, as one would see in someone sitting in a long seated position, the forward rotation, anterior tip, and externally rotate and external rotation so often seen at the left ilium on humans in the anterior inlet should all be reduced. Um, and I'm not here to I'm not here to give you hypothetical information. I'm here to give you factual information. And that's why when you see illustrations like this from our institute, this is a factual information illustration. The problem with individuals who cannot get a, a, a leg to rotate correctly, a spine to go the other direction, and a nomen to move opposite of the other one in a alternating reciprocal way, the problem begins right here where a hamstring attaches. 
This, this foramen obturator is an obturator that is connected directly to pressure management of your pelvis. That is your pelvic floor. And so if you operatively don't understand the purposes of pivoting, operatively, you're looking at pelvis discord and dysfunction through the lens of someone who is in a vacuum. Uh, and therefore they act like vacuums. They do not have the ability to produce pressure, push, pull. They're constantly sucking. They're constantly pulling because of that lack of push from those two ischial sites. In the same position, the accompaniment of internal rotation of the sacrum on the ilium, so often seen in the left posterior outlet, should also con concomitantly be reduced. That's what this is a picture of. All right. So that was just an example we're going to do with the other six or seven areas. We're just going to go over some, I'll throw some research in there, but I want this to be a factual, objective webinar, not that any of them aren't that I give. But I think there's a lot of misunderstanding when we start looking at obturators. Obturator foramen regulation of foramen magnum location is really critical. Our necks and our brain stem is responsible for not only how we cognitively think and process, but how we, how we subconsciously act. And the communication between the obturator foramen and the two, uh, I mean, the two obturator foramen and the frame and magnum is one to one. Hopefully this next this, this section will help you understand that. Most of us are right-handed dominant people. And it is unlike, it is likely that most people therefore would, will continue to perform the majority of activities with their right hands. Uh, it is likely that most people will continue to perform majority of activities with their right hands. Consequently, many of us are more skilled at manipulating the right side environment and reaching in rightward space and therefore demonstrating or demonstrate comparatively less skill, re less skill reaching leftward or to the non-dominant side. The extent to which reach distance reflects dynamic balance varies with the strategy that's used. Most strategic patterns used to maintain upright balance when reaching with one or both hands and arms include the use of the calcaneal muscle and the ischial tuberosity muscle to center the frame and magnum between two points of the floor or ground up sense of support. So as I shift and sway, my brain stem knows that. My frame and magnum is positioned because of the tuberosity activity going on with the communication through the floor from the calcaneus in my ischial seat. The long-seated Haruska alternating reciprocal rotation test enables one to place position and rest the frame and magnum in a centered state of stability that is close to the ground for upper extremity regulation of forward locomotor movement without demand placed on the lower extremities for lift. It allows the human bipedal gait, a characteristic four limb pattern with anti-phase arm swing, which means when one arm is going forward, the other one should be going back and vice versa. And the same frequency as the lower limb oscillation occurs. This is a wonderful article, We're Sync. Uh, she's written many, uh, she, our new hero here in the Institute. I don't know where she's been all my life. Such arm swing has been suggested to contribute to stabilization, energetic efficiency and recruitment or recruiting of neuronal support for maintaining the cycle or cyclical motor patterns that are necessary for brainstem and frame and magnum reciprocal lateralized centering. We don't center over our feet. We center, we center under our brainstem. Uh, flip the coin. Uh, Re restructure your thought. We are not humans that center over two feet. We're humans that are trying to center a brainstem. And the brainstem is centered between two shoulder blades, uh, two collarbones, two scapulas, two anomalous of the hip, uh, two femurs, 
and definitely two heel bones. Controlled side to side movement of the forward movement of the, of the excuse me, of the frame and magnum, thank you, Jen, can usually be preserved and reestablished in the long seated position. position. I'll reread that, kind of a big deal why I'm doing the webinar. Side to side movement, therefore, of our brain stem can be preserved, maintained, reestablished in the long seated position. In this position, the optory foramen, your OFs, are placed in a position, in positions that complement each other and give the brain stem a bilateral sense of the ground, better than your foot will ever give you that. The obturator externus, or the OE muscle, is positioned to provide the greatest control of that centric foramen magnum function. I'll read it again. The obturator foramen, the obturator externus, is a muscle that positions, that helps you position for the greatest control of centric sense, memorial sense, memory sense, which is foramen magnum function. So when you look at this bone and look at this innominate, this hole is covered with, covered with obturator muscle, externus and internus. And that obturator muscle surrounds a major part of that hole. That muscle is a brain stem sensory component. Your sense of yourself begins here when you're upright. I repeat that. Your sense of yourself begins here when you're upright. I didn't stutter. And that sense cannot be gotten if the sense of that bone, of that bone is not resonating in that hole above the foramen obturator. That hole, that glenoid, that acetabulum hole is receiving information from the brain via the brain receiving information from the hole directly below it. The sensory cortex is picking up this information, doing something with it synaptically to send down information for this hole to encaps to cover a femoral head for rotary organized function. So when you put something in a foot that changes the dimension of this hole, you're not doing anything to the brain first here. You're first connecting with the brain directly underneath through the br same bone through that hole. This hole, should, you should try to use as much as you can for sensory information. Otherwise, you become orthostatic challenged. There's a word for that. It's called POTS, dysautonomia. We look at these people and we say, man, they need a heel. They need a hamstring. Of course they do. For cortical sets process that begins with that bones inlet and outlet by the orientation and the sense experience at the tuberosity that's underneath all of it. The same bone that's giving you that sense will then be directed and guided by muscles that I just went over with you to help steer the femoral rotation that you desire from your upper limbs. I, uh, I listen to that and I think about it and I think about it a lot. And I start off, and you're seeing this, uh, this uh, webinar, started 40, 42 years to be exact, uh, dealing with uh, people that had decubiti ulcer in both of their ischial seats that they couldn't get off of. They were sitting in wheelchairs, their spinal cord injuries, diabetics, and they just couldn't get off of it. They just, you know, they had to sit on uh, surfaces that didn't erode dermis, skin. And once you clean a few people for a few years in your life by redressing it, the bandages three or four times a day, and 
giving him whirlpools, cleaning up this uh, area that can't heal because of poor pressure management. It changes you. And my whole life has been directed and dedicated to those people. They don't know how to offload. Now I'm working with people that have the same kind of problems. You just don't see the decubiti. You're working with the same people. You just don't see the decubiti. And so I was lucky. I saw the decubiti. I got, I got lucky in my life. And so for me to stand up here and say to you that, you know, we're so good about managing AF and FA, and we're so good about managing inlets and outlets. Don't ever forget the reason why we're good at it. This institute started that process. Uh, we're good at it because we respect, I respect pressure. And you should respect it too. You were made with the body to unload, to offload, to inhibit. So the other side has purpose. And that's why when I look at these two pictures that have been around for quite a while, uh, I just want to remind you that I have this thing in my office that says, uh, do you have hole control, Jen? You, you saw it. Uh, it's a question. Do you have hole control? Because if you don't have this control right here, you're lost. You have to be lost. Your uh, cranial disturbance of what I would call an on and off switch, uh, which is called autonomics, is how you are regulated. And the regulation was not given to you to be all autonomic generated. We have a central nervous system that depends on it when the threat is high. But people do that do not have whole control are regulated by emotions, anxiety, threat, fear, and definitely uh, uh, poor posture. So this OE, this obturator externus contribution, contributes to adduction of the flex tip underlying it, while the obturator internus, the OI, plays a role in abducting the flex tip. One is responsible for adduction of the brain and abduction of the brain. I meant that. Movement of adduction and abduction is called lateral frontal plane, side to side, reciprocal activity. Maker who made you gave you both on that hole. You don't even have to think about it. It has been well established that the OI is a postural muscle that holds the femoral head and the acetabulum. It's a muscle in this long seated position that helps your individuals you're working with, and maybe even you, provide the adduction control of the femur and the acetabulum during leg lifting and reaching. If the OE, OE muscle on the other side of that foramen, it's, it's that muscle that provides the pivotal guidance for the acetabulum on the femur during hip adduction. That's what it's all about. That's the purpose of that long seated positional test. The obturator muscles, both OI and OE muscle, muscle work synergistically with surrounding muscle to provide hip mobility as the neck and, the, as the neck and head or the, this, this frame and magnum that's responsible for your neck and head is centered between the two converging ischial tuberosities. You know what? What is posture? Good posture is simply this. Can you put your feet on both sides of your frame and magnum? Can you put your sit bones on both sides of your frame and magnum? Can you put your shoulder blades on both sides of your frame and magnum? Because that's brainstem. Uh, that's your base. That's ganglia. Uh, that's your cerebellum. Their primary function is external rotation of the hip. That's your primary function. Both of them externally rotate your hip, even though they have different frontal plane characteristics. One's an adductor, one's an abductor. But they both are responsible for external rotation of the hip, which means they're both responsible for rotary direction of your body. If they're responsible for external rotation of the hip, they're also responsible for rotational direction of your body to the other side. For both foramen magnum hole control and obturator foramen hole control. 
So when you see these pictures, we've had we've had lots of pictures pictures in our institute. And again, I just I just pull them up, Jen, just to remind people that hole, that hole is constantly in communication with those two holes. And these two holes, these two holes are directed by that communication. There's not one of you in the world that's gonna take and turn on a hamstring and make these two holes operate differently if that hamstring excitement didn't brighten something up in this this calca this this cal uh, calcaneum calvaria this calvaria sensed it and it's saying that is not cool on my brain stem what i just described to you is called neutrality that's true neutrality Let's talk about level three and level five recommendations of this test. This is uh, outlined in the handouts that have this test levels. There's five of them. Just look at uh, Alex here. She Look where she's at. Forget about the writing for a minute. Uh, she's got one hand in front of the other hand, while the other hand around that middle finger is rotating. And she's taking that middle finger and she's reaching as far as she can and reaching with both hands going in as far as they can in different directions. This is called a reach. That is a reach. This means nothing if that is not something. I'll repeat it. Her right hand going back, which we how many right low trap and right tricep techniques do we have, Jen? Hundreds. I countless. Is all have all been designed for this ability for that middle finger to sense tuberosities. The ability to perform level three of this test requires one to rotate their trunk to the right by reaching with the left hand arm toward the right foot while maintaining contact with a pivotal point, a pivotal point called the left sit bone. This requires and reflects the ability to integrate the left obturators, the iliococcygeus and the hamstrings, i.e. your pelvic outlet, to interact with the left IOs and TAs and iliacus muscles, i.e. your pelvic inlet. These are some of the uh, supportive techniques that I've included with this webinar that would support the need to process that cortically. These are level three supportive techniques when you can't get enough of that sense of pivoting through that left ischial seat. You can't get enough of right shoulder extension. You can't get enough of middle finger movement forward on that left side. These are Techniques have been around a long time. They're long seated techniques. A level five, if you look at Alex again, if you just look at Alex sitting there, a level five is her right hand is still going behind her, left hand's going in front of her, but she's not going to lose her ischial seat as she hip flexes and offloads the right side. That would require major cortical effort to shift to center of mass as she rotates her spine with a hip flexor to keep the ischial seat alive on the left side for right continuation of shoulder extension. Don't even read it, just look at and listen to what I said. So, does she have the ability to perform level five of this test of this test requires her to advance, excuse me, advance their right leg forward as the left arm swings towards the right toes while maintaining, again, jam contact with the left, the left one. Left ischial tuberosity.
This requires and reflects the ability to integrate. It requires the ability to integrate your right rectus femoris, your sartorius, your gluteus maximus, your piriformis, and coccygeus with your left abs and iliacus and ischiocondylar adductor and gluteus medius and hamstrings, all muscles outlined in this institute by uh, lateral function. It says left, it says right. Forget the muscles. It says a head that's shifting to the right and then it can shift to the left. It's on and off. A level five activity for some people is hard because they don't have that ability to turn something on and turn something off. And uh, their ability to maintain that turn on and turn off while they're sensing their left heel, their left ischial seat is very difficult for humans and the world we live in. These are some recommendations I would make to you that have been around for years for cortical alternated memorial because it's a memory and you're trying to make it memorial, it's going to last for a long time through the brainstem. These are brainstem activities. You want to say anything about those, Jen? No, like Ron said, they're all emphasizing that left calcaneal tuberosity. Let's go to another one. Let's talk about another category. Long-seated tensegrity and the tension associated with it. Our positional sense of our location between the two sides of our body is not better appreciated by our sensory and motor cortex than it is through crawling on hands and knees or moving forward in the long seated position. Both the pisiform and the patella sesamoids and in all four position and the ischial and calcaneus tuberosities in a long seated position provide controlled centering of your sternum and your sacrum. So this all four right AIC pelvic floor respiratory crawl is a wonderful gift for normal human function. What you do with inhalation and what you do with exhalation as, the, as you know, at the end of inhalation, your right hand and right knee, right hand, right pisiform, right patella should be close to each other as your trunk remains side bent to the left. Those are tuberosity techniques. That's an ischial and heel tuberosity technique. The all four position allows equalization of body mass through the flexed hips and flexed shoulders to sequence sensory motor skills used for upper extremity reach in all fours for shift sense. We go over that in the human evolution course. If you uh, worked with people like I did that were um, put in wheelchairs and rolled themselves around a life through a wheelchair, you would understand that if you asked them, what is it that they miss? What is it that they miss? They'd say, not really too much. I don't really miss that much. I wheel myself with a, you know, my two hands. And I can get around pretty much anywhere now these days. But if you say to them, you ask them, what function do you miss? Nine times out of 10, they'll say, I miss getting in all fours. Nine times out of 10. And a long seated position is really cortically an all four functional state of mind. And so when you think about how you move your body, you don't move your body with two legs. You can't. You pull your body with two legs if you don't incorporate the hands. You push and pull your body around in life with all four. And it's really important for us to remember that you've evolved around two parts of your body. You've evolved around two axes of your body built off of ischial tuberosities and calcaneal tuberosities. That's how humans evolve posturally. You don't evolve any other way. So the long seated position allows 
equalization of body mass through flexed hips and flexed shoulders. To sequence sensory motor skills used for lower extremity reach in a hemi-long seated positional state for sense of alternation reciprocation. That's a big statement. Nothing is better than walking backwards downstairs because you're doing that through flexed hips and flexed shoulders. You're working with individuals who do not know how to incorporate backwards walking on one side. We're all working with people that we want them to move forward with. And unfortunately, sometimes at the same time on both sides. Even a person moving in around in a wheelchair knows that if I want to go to my left or my right, one of those arms is going to pull the wheel back while the other wheel is going to be going jammed forward. Even they get it better than we do. Take it away for a while and you'll understand the significance of this section that we're on right now. We offer many techniques that are incorporated, incorporate referencing of the ischial and calcaneal tuberosity for sensory motor awareness of their left tuberosities and for right side advancement on and through a pivotal point of reference, referred to as the left ischial tuberosity and the left calcaneus. It's everywhere in our institute. These tuberosities, especially on the left side of our body, allow the safe and appropriate integrated integration of con concomitant activity of the hip flexors and their contralateral abdominals. Our upper trunk and our cervical independence from the lower body depends on these two tuberosity sites. And this abdominal sequencing with, con with their contralateral hip flexors, flexors and alternating function associated with it. The long seated techniques, especially with the vibrational bands on that modified unit of tensegrity is such a great teaching tool making, tool making us so aware of how to respectively stop and start our shifts with heels and toes. My colleague, my brilliant colleague, Jen Smart uh, told me that. So here are some of your other activities that can complement this, this area of this webinar. Egocentric equalizing recommendations. How to find yourself. How to represent yourself egocentrically. Uh, these are wonderful techniques. Supportive techniques. They're, 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 they're allowing you to sense shift because you don't have to hold yourself up. You have two floors you're on. You have a floor that has you laying on it called the wall with your feet on the wall called the floor. You've got two floors to help relocate yourself, to help resense a wrist that has a middle finger to it, a middle finger to it, a middle finger to it. Those calcaneuses are the only contact points for those middle fingers. And they've got to pass. That sensor information is passing through an ischial tuberosity for a base of foundational support to equalize the tension on the brainstem, to relax an autonomic nervous system, to make you feel safe from falling. Been waiting for the day to talk about it. So it's not that you haven't been doing it, but I want to remind us all why we are doing it. it is one thousand percent cortical. These are all egocentric equalizing techniques. The long seated resisted single arm pullback. It's supported by wall. Jen helped put the language together. Where you see the word support, it means support. So you can learn how to re-support. So you can become more equalized in a support system, a good system, when you move forward or back. And there's probably no way you're going to empower cortical tuberosity sense 
than through decline retro walking. To my knowledge, that's one of the most beautiful long seated positions I've ever offered anybody in this institute. That lady is in a long seated position, reaching with one hand as the other arm is going back. Our body is a structural system of isolated components that operate under compression through continuous tension. Underline it. Continuous tension is required when you have sets of tuberosities. Your tuberosities provide the tensegrity of your tension that complements this, this range of resistance required for you to move phasically through a gamma system, a beta system. And it's arranged in such a way that the compressed members, your legs and arms, do not ever touch each other. You were not meant to touch yourself. While the pre-stressed tensioned hamstrings, they're always pre-stressed. The lower traps, they're always pre-stressed. The triceps are always pre-stressed. Delineate and equalize the system's spatial information. I put a lot of work in these slides. I don't want to regret anything I say, but this is a slide that's been around a long time. Uh, that's tension integrity. It's floating, the thorax, the abdomen. It requires cortical and thalamic sense of clavicular, sternal, and ilial sacrum compression. The orientation of the sacral promontory and sternal manubrial location is provided by points of reference that are easily synchronized when in an all four or long seated position. Many dissociation syndromes can be related to this maltensegrity. Spitzer will tell you, dissociation may re represent a functional disconnectivity. This research article reports that the high dissociation, the, the high dissociators, people that had lots of dissociation, had a significantly lower left hemisphere excitability than the right one did, the right hemisphere. So even our association, Jen, and our disassociation is dissymmetrical. The neural basis of our dissociation may involve a cortical asymmetry with a left hemisphere superiority or alternatively, a lack of right hemisphere integration. Our hemispheric activity, our left side, requires the right side to stay superior. When you drop off the left side of your body or the right hemisphere, your association with things around you goes, Jen, down. That research will tell you that. Your cortical lighting up is therefore dependent on hemisphere alternation. Your hemispheres need to alternate sense. You can't alternate sense in the hemispheres if you don't understand pivotal points of rotation. I get excited about it because that's psychiatry. And uh, when you have a clear understanding of what I just did, you'll appreciate psychophysiology dysfunction. The right cortical hemispheric integration with the left cortical hemispheric sensory motor activity reduces disruption in the usual integrated functions of consciousness, memory, identity, and perception of the environment. I'll repeat that. Right cortical hemisphere integration with left cortical hemisphere sensory motor activity makes us more egocentric minded psychologists. Our behavior is balanced. It's loaded and unloaded. It's demanded and undemanded. The long seated position offers a more stable, controlled experience of hemispatial and hemicortical multisensory integration. Riva, this is an article you must get.
for non-dominant lateralization awareness of perception, proprioception, and interoception, and vestibular input. Our body memory is built off of and around this multisensory integration. So I put, I put this, this is from that article, and it's just, it's just a reminder how we started this webinar. It's memory. Our body memory, our, us, you, our memory is built off of this proprioception, interoception, and vestibular input from, once, from the inside of our body to be only integrated with what we perceive from the outside of our body. The inside of our body depends on your ischial tuberosities and your calcaneal tuberosities. It depends on that. I think I said, you know, I get excited about that, Jen. So now we're on, I think, is this number five? I can't remember which one we're on, Jen. Long seated long floor implications on the ontogenetic development of upright body memory. We just left it. We just talked about upright body memory briefly. The stages and transitions that a human experiences and processes from the early conception of heel sense and its relationship to the ischial seats and the growing guidance provided by the, the sesamoid bones, your patella and your piece form, for upright balance standing and forward locomotor movement is referred to as human ontogeny. Ont ontogenetic processes are involved in growth and development from the moment we set up. The analysis of the development of childhood body representation is important for understanding the role body memory plays in different cognitive functions. Body use and processes of functional representations develop slowly in life and in a fragmented man manner, reaching maturity at the age of 10 to 11. Anytime after this, maturity age of 11, the long seated position could be implemented to redirect and reestablish cortical and midbrain frequencies for better sense of appropriate location of yourself, of the child, of the young adult, and body centered of body centering of mass. Body centering of mass, the memory associated with it should be there at the age of 10 and 11. We have humans that still don't have it at the age of seven and they're 40, 50 years of age, et cetera. It's really all about our sense of center of mass. That's really what it's all about. When you break it right down, Jen, what's it really all about? What's this webinar really all about? Sense of where you are. Done. Every time you see that test, Jen, every time you see those words alternating and reciprocal, it's really about where are you? And the thresholds of synchronized pattern, which is cortical and midbrain thresholds, are networked. They're networks of frequency activity in your brain that's assimilated to change, challenge, and redesign of shape. We master ourselves on how we feel by how we look inside, not on the outside. Those thresholds are built off of these tuberosity functions, period, and are associated with synchronized three-dimensional effort to remain in an acceptable position of both ego or you know, both outside and inside sense of ourselves for our physical alternation and physiological respiration that's required in life. Our brain may learn to discriminate between different frequencies, especially gamma, because of the process called synaptic plasticity. That allows us connections between neurons to change with experience provided by, again, the calcaneus and the ischial tuberosities. I am giving you now a psychophysiology webinar. The individuals have an innate superiority of habitual propensity for processing information with one or the other cerebral hemisphere, more or less independent of the situation demands. This is referred to as hemisphere, 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 hi, 
practice all day on this. Hemispherosity. Hemispherosity. I'm going to read it again, Jen, because this is the rest of the talk. We have an innate superiority of habit. And that propensity is processed. It's processed information through cerebral hemispherity, which is, is a reference to what one is doing while the other one is working. Not why one is doing while the other one's not. So regardless if one truly is operating in a more analytical, logical, sequential manner through use of our left hemisphere or operating in a more holistic, intuitive, sim simultaneous manner with calcaneal ischial tuberosities, when used operatively for forward locomotor alternating movement, one should help provide the sense to balance hemisphericity. We need cortical representation from structural manifestation that's provided by these two sites of, of pull and push, those, those tuberosity regions. This is a picture, it's a, my grandson's little shoe. And I put it on this stick figure to remind you that I want this hemisphericity to be mindful, not of a leg, but I want the, the toe and this ischial seat, this heel, I want that brain to understand that entire leg's length of sense. Because when I take that shoe off and I put that leg on the floor, that person may not have that ischial sense. So I put the shoe on to remind you all, as big as we are in this institute about left heel strike, we've never not been that big about left ischial posterior tuberosity strike. So this sense that's being picked up by this length of this shoe is what our brain needs a lot of on that side. We have people we're working with that has this shoe sense from the heel to the tuberosity that they sit on as a shoe, as a bottom of their foot sense. They live over there. They're on that all the time. They get in a long seated position and they feel that big shoe on that right side. I want to, them to feel this big shoe called a leg on the left side. And to do that, I put the shoe on to remind all of you, not only do they need a heel on the left side, which would be the bottom of this shoe, this bottom of this forefoot, but they need a heel on that left side, which is the bottom of that shoe. They need to feel their left ischial seat hit something. As the left heel is hitting something. Because if they're hitting something on the left heel and they're still over to the right ischial seat, it does nothing cortically for that brain except dissociates themselves hemispherically. You'll, you will really please me if you take a picture of that, put it somewhere, and look at it. And then think about your patients you're working with. And what you're trying to really do in this institute with reference and reference and, and contact points, Jen, it would really make a lot more sense to that individual that we're trying to grow strikers and reachers. We're trying to grow strikers and reachers. Strikers and reachers. To unload to offload. We want to offload. We want pressure offloading and arm reaching because of that. So this, uh, this test and all these uh, long seated non-manual techniques are and have always been designed around pressure management as related to forward and lateral positioning, which is necessary, please underline it, for cortical mapping and synchronized synapse of kinesthetic behavior. Where are you? Jen said it. Where are you? 
You will always be over to the right side. You will always be on your big toe. You will always be on your little toes on the right side. You always use a left toe to get over there. That's representation of what you've used to make a memory of cortical support from tuberosity, afferentation. I've learned a great deal from individuals, like I said, who have non-traumatic spinal cord injuries, traumatic spinal cord issues as well, and partial spinal cord injuries. I have put programs together for those who have developed a where and were developing ischial pressure ulcer secondary to other contributing dysfunctional dysfunction and disease. Both of these categories of people with S SCI and non-SCI have contributed to my deepest sense and appreciation for pressure relief and for a contralateral sense of load and lift. To appreciate true trunk location and function during forward advancement of our body, your ischial pressure, the ischial pressure offloading, needs to send signals to our motor cortex and midbrain relay centers for reciprocal inhibition that's provided by our central pattern generators of our thoracic and lumbar spine. That's where they are located. Reaching forward with an upper extremity as a contralateral lower extremity reaches forward, accentuates this behavior, and empowers the shift of body mass through trunk rotary feed forward directions. In other words, our pressure inside of us, under us, and around us are all controlled and managed by thoracic abdominal rotation abilities or limitations. Our thoracic rotation function or lack of it is designed, patterned, and positioned by the accompaniment of hetero arm and leg reach. Furthermore, our hypothalamus and our baroreceptors receive information from sites of our body that are all designed to help us sense our anti-gravity body position upon early advancement of ourself. Our baroreceptors are located just below the midbrain and are at the, advantage, uh, the most advantageous position to monitor and safeguard our blood pressure, our flow to our brain, and our intracranial system. Our sense of gravitational induced pressure exi exists, especially at two locations. Lubats, 2014. The buttocks below the ischial tuberosities and the foot below the heel. <laughs> so important to understand. Pressure ulcers develop at sites where relief provided through alternation of contact here is reduced. To relieve pressure at the ischial tuberosity region or to sense load on the opposite ischial site, one has to move the upper thorax forward on the side sense of load is desired. The side sense of load is desired. This forward movement of the thorax is enhanced through arm and scapula ipsilateral forward reach. We pivot and position ourselves around ischial tuberosities and posterior calcaneal tuberosities for this cortical reference of load and unload. SCI research and associated science provides a plethora of statistical significance and corollaries on this topic, plethora of it. The Veterans Administration is noted, notoriously looking at it. One research article in particular addresses the relationship between arm reaching, trunk function, and strength, and offloading of the ischial tuberosities, Gabison. Participants in this study were, who were able to engage in multi-directional reach tests were declined as reachers, whereas individuals who were unable to engage in the multi-directional reach test were defined as non-reachers. Trunk strength was significant higher in the reachers compared to the non-reachers. Um, you know, it's, a, it's important just to stop and reflect a little bit. Uh, we don't ever own ourselves. You never own yourselves. You never have choices you can make, complete choices you can make. You never have freedom to, to 
change frequencies or like something you don't like or uh, move away from something you're threatened by or change directions in life. I could go on and on. If you don't understand the power and the purpose of arm reaching. It's just, it's just incredibly difficult for me to go on without reflecting on this research. You were given arms. Uh, your arms developed, they developed because of the sense of support that was offered by pivotal points. Arms are rotational units. They can't do both pivotal work and rotational function. They can't do both. If you want them to do both, take a breath of air in and hold it the rest of your life. Now, if you'd like to use your arms, you have to figure out how to pivot somewhere in your body without using your arms. So I'm just off script now. And it just makes me edgy to even talk about research when we still don't even know how to put the research in real life. There isn't a technique in our institute that is not looking at pressure management of arms. It's a critical important thing to consider. And so I can't move off too fast here because that's what this tuberosities allow you to do. If you don't have your tuberosity sense, your reaching is now robot, artificial intelligence because it's now all autonomic. It's all threat to posture. Arms de-threaten postural load. When you don't have arm function though, it's the greatest threat to postural load you can possibly generate. There, that's what I wanted to say. Offloading times over the left and right ischial tuberosities were lower in non-reachers when compared with reachers. However, the results were significantly and statistically uh, significant only for the right ischial tuberosity. This research is saying the left ischial tuberosity, uh, don't worry about it, it'll offload. But Jen, you know what? I got it. Somehow these people called humans don't know how to get right of skill tuberosities to offload. And again, one more time, I can look at you out there and say, how much research does it take for us to remind ourselves how dis dissynchronously we operate with dissymmetry? How often does that occur across the board when we don't have people understand how to use pivotal points? And we are all referencing one pivotal point. Here's another research article. They'll say the right ischial tuberosity is kind of like, you know, sunshine to us. It's there all the time. Our brains light up with it every time we are doing something. But on the left side, don't worry. You know, that there's no problem with that part side. You can go on it and it's easy to get off of it. But once you go on that right side and you got a memory of that right side, it likes to hang around. You know, lights never get shut off. You're awake in the middle of the night. And so that's why I just take time with this article and say, uh, it's important for you to remember that. This is a good reflection of this biased mass issue. It's a good reflection of the biased mass distribution to the right in humans and how arm swing and reach disrupt, disrupts the pattern ischial load on the right ischial seat and sitting. You want to disrupt it. You want to get off of it. My goodness. You're developing the cubit eye. He also found that there is a, Gabson also found that there's an existence, there exists a significant difference between walkers and wheelchair users for strength measurements, but not for multi-directional reach distance. Left and right side reaches increase in wheelchair users only. They use their arms. They're balanced. 
significant association between, between changes in hip strength, trunk strength, and reach distance were found between the two activities. Reciprocal forward and backward arm reaching performed in a sagittal plane while sitting on a wheelchair significantly influenced strength parameters of the hip and trunk strength and range of motion of the arm, Gabison. That's the research we should be looking at. You don't see wheelchairs under people. Uh, I see uh, people who are struggling uh, when they walk because they're only in a wheelchair going one direction with one arm, round and round and round and round to one side. Our midbrain limb control during reaching movements is outlined in the next few paragraphs. The structure in the rostral midbrain that is involved in movement and motor control and inner limb coordinated reaching is the red nucleus. I think we should kind of bring it, to, bring it home right here. It connects with the, cerebe the cerebellum, the cerebral cortex, and the spinal cord. It's particularly participatory in maintenance of muscular tone. Your tone is generated by those areas. And the coordination of inner limb tone, inner limb activity, is coordinated by that red nucleus. It's in your brain stem. It's in the foramen magnum. So here's a picture of it, and you can Google this as well as I can show it to you, but this is called the red nucleus. And it's sandwiched between, uh, you know, it's sandwiched between the substantia nigra. Nigra. Uh, don't have time to go over all that. But this, this oculomotor nerve, which we'll be talking about later this, this, this year, all of that is all interconnected. And that is right above right above the shelf called the frame and magnum. The red nucleus and substantial nigra are subcortical centers of the extrapyramidal motor system. The majority of its axons do not project to the spinal cord, but via its parvocellular part, relays information from the motor cortex to the cerebellum through the inferior olivary complex called the rubrospinal tract. And that's an important relay center in the medulla. Your tuberosities keeps it as a relay center. It plays a primary role in the motor control of the upper arm and shoulder. And I would encourage you to remember that. It's a primary, it's a primary brain part for shoulder and arm function. All four crawling of babies is controlled by this nucleus early on in life. And it's meant to stay throughout your life if you can swing your arms. The lesions of the red nucleus usually result in contralateral tremors, ataxia, choreoform movement, resting Parkinson-like tremors, oculopilotal myoclonus, or pendular vertical oscillations of the eyes and palate. You can you can definitely produce lesion-like symptoms by staying over one tuberosity in your life ontogenically, through ontogeny. In other words, you don't get off of it. And you develop the synapse of, act synapse of synaptic activity. And you start to use the midbrain as a relay center with partial relay. And then you get tremors and you get static, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because the frame and magnum is no longer centered between pivotal points of contact. This possibly explains why reaching with arms and legs in an antiphase of motor coordination in a long seated position is often clinically seen in patients who want to calm and regulate muscle tone. Calm someone down, put them in a long seated position. They're, they, they, they're re regulating relays with clarity, centric clarity. It's participation in speech production, pain processing, sensory discrimination, and completing complex tasks has been demonstrated by functional magnetic resonance studies conducted over the last 20 years. These, these functionalities 
have therefore attributed to the red nucleus with the, exec with the execution of learned behavior. And here's some suggestions I'm gonna leave with you that I think are really important to at least uh, you know, show, Jan, before we end this webinar. Um, a lot of people come approach me over my lifetime and say, well, look, you know, I can't, I, I can't sit in a long seated position. Uh, I'm just too, too tight. My hamstrings are too tight. And I always remind them, I know that's one side of, that's one side of the coin, but the tension, in the hamstrings that limits people to, uh, that limits the ability to get in a long seat position is not the issue. The issue is separating one leg from the other leg. That's the issue. That is the issue. And that tension is either orientation tension or it's red nucleus tension. And so I look at people and I say, look it, I've got three, three activities you can do right off the bat to get in a long seated position. Number one, all four belly lift walking. Even if you walk there, get your pisiform and your patellas understanding intra limb function. Get a heel down in that position. Feel your butt bone in that position. Wiggle your tail around. Shift your body mass around. Sense the floor from a perspective that you don't know you've got. This is how you developed. If that's hard for you, get as close as you can to the wall. Just get your feet above your head. And experience posterior mediastinum expansion to decompress, to unload, offload, and allow your hamstrings to do what you can't do. Posteriorly rotate your pelvis. And allow you to energize what you should be doing. Raise your anterior spine up, not with a diaphragm. Things we all talked about in this webinar. And then do whatever you can. Don't, don't do anything yet with a test. We know you're going to fail it. Do whatever you can to bring your legs out and then back in in a long seated position to encourage rotation. Maybe put something under the two sit bones as you do it. A block of wood, clothing, I don't care what, just to elevate those sit bones. Maybe do that by sitting on the edge of a chair and put a bar in your hand. and reach forward. Just learn, what does it feel like to feel the floor with your sit bones? Because until your brain feels the floor with your sit bones, it's not gonna let you sit in a long seated position. If that's hard for you to do, why don't you feel your sit bones with the floor that's allowing you to roll back and forth to get the sit bones? You can't keep correct tensegrity tension without sense of how to regulate sit bones. And I didn't say regulate sit bones. I said regulate the sense of sit bones. You've got two. And that's what this uh, Hereska alternating reciprocal rotation, rotation, rotation test was designed for 35 years ago. And one thing that um, when we put out the restoring alternation guide a few years ago, um, we recommended getting in a long seated position before bed, maybe reading or meditating or saying your prayers, anything in that position. And, and we recommended that if someone couldn't get into that position to get on their knees in like a, a tall kneeling or even a short kneeling position and feel their Ischial their sit bones. on their heels yep. in that short kneeling position where you have your buttock sitting back on your heels so that you can sense those two regions and then eventually work your way towards a long seated position. So that's another recommendation that we have outlined in that restoring alternation guide that's available on our website as well. 
Well, thank but, you. Yes, Are thank there? you everyone for joining us for and just for your interest. Um, I know a lot of you who we see today on screen, you've been here for all of these. Um, and we really appreciate you being here and your interest in these tests. And um, we know you'll continue using them in, you know, the many years to come. And uh, we hope that these uh, webinars have been helpful in your understanding of the history as to kind of why they were created and how you can continue to use them in your uh, practice um, as a uh, movement specialist. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, there are a couple questions. Um, so let's see, just one question that came in earlier. Someone wanted just to clarify all the techniques that we had outlined in this webinar. You do want to make sure someone has established neutrality. Mm -hmm. Those are not repositioning techniques. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure someone is neutral before doing any of these techniques. You know, I uh, like the egocentric ones and that level three and level five, you know, if they can get to a level three or level five, they've got to be neutral. They wouldn't be able to get to that level if they. You, you sure definitely want to do that, Jen. There's always exceptions to every rule, right? And for the most part, we're all, I, I assume everybody in Hollywood, anybody driving a car or listening to this discussion on tape or whatever, keep in mind that we're, we're doing the very best we can to get people to get neutral. But this webinar was not designed on how to educate people to get people neutral. Mm -hmm. This webinar was designed, if you have no understanding about PRI and you're listening to something by the founder for the first time, it's to help all of us appreciate lateralized sense of cooperative uh, alternation by the two sides of the body. A lot of your people, a lot of the people listening to this may not understand what neutrality means. So for those that do, it would be ideal if you at least know that you're capable of getting somebody in a neutral state. It may not last. It may not be something that is, you know, capable of being held on to, but you know they have the ability to carry out these type of techniques. For somebody who doesn't understand a word I just said, and you want to experiment with some of the techniques that we're showing you, uh, you're not going to hurt yourself or harm yourself by doing these techniques if you are not neutral. In fact, it's some of the safest information in this, in this uh, uh, state of mind we're in when it comes to postural integration of upright management of gravity. It's, it's some of the safest activities you could do. So in, in response, yes, it would be wonderful if you got people neutral so this can be sensed more easily, but for some of you who don't know what I meant by that, you're not going to hurt somebody by attempting to do some of these techniques. I hope that made some sense. I think so. Um, uh, Gad asked, is the relationship between the pisiforms and the middle finger rib cage as a not analog, anal analogous? I cannot say that word. Analogous? Analogous, analogous no. as the relationship between analogous, the calcaneus and the second toe or the pelvis. Well, of course it is, but it's not, you're not going to see research. I don't know who asked that. Of course it is. You're not going to see research that says this is analogous to, you know, this part of your body, this part of your body. Of course it is. Your brain works around. Whenever you see two bones rotating on each other in your body, there is going to be a memorial, memorable sense of axial rotation. It's reproducible by where you put your mass of yourself. So your rotation around an axis is going to be where you use it the most. And that's always coming back to where do you position yourself and the mass of your body. That syn synapse activity is built upon the position that you have created this network, this burst of activity when you start to rotate. You go to a position that is a memory, it's a habit, it's adaptation that was created as you saw that one article uh, try to get across. It's a memory. So one side doesn't mean that you're gonna do the same thing the same way on the other side. You're a human, I doubt that's gonna happen. But is it analogous to it? Of course it is. It's analogous anytime you see two bones rotating on each other. Um, the next question, um, Loke asked on this technique that I have pulled up here, this long-seated bar reach, long-seated integration number two, 
Um, he asked if we have the ability to control the weight of the bar for this technique and other bar reach techniques, should we? And is there an ideal weight range? Or do you want just a- well, Loki, okay, I respect you a lot. Like this? I respect, this has nothing to do with any weight. This has to do with a surface between two hands. This became a pelvis. It's between two hands. It's just helping this individual sense this hand via that hand. Now, if you want to use weight, totally your call. The more you put, the more weight you have on that, the more the anterior tibialis is going to brighten up on your brainstem in, in your courses. This is just meant to roll. This is meant to roll. All you're doing is sliding and rolling to keep uniformity, to distribute weight, not of the bar, but weight of this individual through two ischial seats. That's why that was designed. I designed that technique around a word called rotational reach. The webinar is called alternating reciprocal rotational test rotational so this rotation if it's limited because of the issues we talked about today that bar will keep the rotation honest because if you over rotate on one ischial seat by offloading the other you are no longer rotating your foramen magnum correctly it's disymmetric it's dissymmetrical it's no longer an asymmetrical issue. It's a dissymmetrical issue. And I, I'm really bothered by people using asymmetry inappropriately. Your body is asymmetrical, but your body is more dissymmetrical than it is asymmetrical. You're creating dissymmetry when you don't understand principles like this. Your brainstem was met not to be limited by a foramen orientation of bone. You weren't made that way. Anyway, I hope- to Follow up on that, sense. just follow up on that discussion. Uh, there was a question that said, so the sense of the bar on the tibia should also be symmetric. You wanna make sure that you're If not that one hand, I'm not sure I'm making myself clear. If one hand on that bar is moving ahead of the other hand, you are now shifting off a ischial seat. You are now offloading a calcaneus at the cost of adapting a head orientation and a condyle on one side of that cranium being now loaded more than unloaded. The sense of that activity is picked up by the red nucleus saying, do you desire that? Then you're fine. Move that hand forward. But if you're doing it, this is not a stretch activity. If you're doing it to equalize egocentricism for spatial orientation and recognition of things you cannot get, why would you move one hand forward than the other hand? I might want to move you in a different figure eight position by advancing you over to the left side with a left arm that's going to go more forward, Jen, than the what? Right. Right. I might do that, but it has nothing to do with weight. And there's lots of other techniques that would do that that wouldn't be this technique necessarily. That this technique was not designed other for that. Techniques for that. So. Okay, I think that wraps up the questions, unless anyone has another question they want to ask. But again, we thank you for joining us. Um, this this test is taught in our cranial resolution course. Yeah, I was just going to say that. For those of you who have not taken this course, it is a wonderful course. It's taught by Jen Smart, who's with us today on this Very webinar. Um, she does a, a great job of applying this information, which can sometimes be a little intimidating because it's talking about cortical um, activity and foramen magnum and brainstem um, and hemispheric activity. 
that we aren't usually as comfortable with as we maybe are with femoral and pelvic muscular activity for a lot of us movement specialists. But she does a great job in relating that to what Ron talked about today. Uh, that foramen magnum and that obturator foramen are, you know, they're in communication at all times. And so the importance of that course is, is just as high as oftentimes a myokin postural and pelvic course. So if you haven't considered taking that course, um, I couldn't encourage it more. Um, it is a tertiary level course. We can't get into this discussion right off the top. Um, but I think hopefully this webinar will help everyone realize that these concepts have always been there. You can't separate one from the other. No. Um, it's, it's, it's like someone's going to talk about in our summit this spring about the mind body connection. You can't separate the two. They are one. This is the same, the same concept. So, um, I don't know, Jen, if you have anything you want to add on to that, of, of what this webinar really did for you and how you break this down even further in that two-day course, but I would be glad to unmute you if you'd like to. You said it. I mean, I take it at a much, much, much simpler level, even though I go to the same concept, you know, I go to the same outcomes and the same conclusions that Ron comes to. I try to make it easy from the very beginning so people understand what frequencies are. And, and the fact that um, uh, when, when I'm thinking about what is going on in the head, it, like if I have, I always am looking at the palate bones, but when this, if I have a cranium right here and I have something in the middle and something moves a little bit off, the frequency on this side will be compressed or, or, or higher than this side. That's picking up and feeding what you're feeling from the floor immediately. What's happening in the middle of the head is happening on the bottom. And that is so simple to understand, but it seems so complex when you put it in all this vocabulary. And I don't mean to um, oversimplified and I don't think I do but I think I try to go back to the basics at the very beginning and understand changes in frequency and changes in frequencies if that made any sense at all yeah well I I think it all makes sense obviously but the scientific basis for this webinar was just to help uh, get people to understand and appreciate uh, the way the way people move with these pivotal points in this webinar. And I know you refer to that in the, in the cranial course. I think operatively, there's people that are looking at this test from a different lens. They're looking at it from a different perspective. I want to, the reason Jennifer, I'm here today with everybody, and we didn't take this lightly, is to give you the rational, scientific, Scientific, scientific principles behind these sites that our cortices function off of. And then getting into the cranium and referencing these sites as, as loosely as we do or as simply as we do should be ever lost in a world of orthopedic management. And that's, it, that's all I'm trying to do today. Exactly. And the the two examples I can give that made it so simple for me is the pterygoids, you, you know, you, yeah. the pterygoids and what they're doing. And mm -hmm. I remember if I can't inhibit an adductor, you know, the IC adductor, the pterygoid could do it. And I saw that happen. And I remember that making a big impact on me. But then it simplified down because when I activate my left lateral pterygoid, I'm shifting my axis. Yep. And when I shift my axis, my adductor no longer has to Correct. be the thing that's holding me. My adductor has just inhibited because I'm over that leg. My yep. axis shift because my pterygoid neurologically told me. So when I go to this side, I can pivot around and this adductor lets go and this one Activate. So what you're happening with the adductor and the AB ductor alternating is exactly what you're doing. And the pterygoid is what's setting that stage for it. Yeah, you're a gift. You're a gift. And again, uh, I'm going to reiterate this. 
uh, we're, we're trying to get people to understand that these basic primary courses uh, open the door for words like uh, uh, inhibition and patterning and shifting and alternation, words that we all know really well. But what precedes the discussion that you just had is it's wonderful and that works. But we have to have a good understanding, though, the brain is not only working off of this pole, it's working off of pivotal points that precedes this pole, pole's tension. And that tension can either inhibit the outcome of what you're wanting, Jennifer, or mm -hmm. can assist it. And sure. that's where your course is, I believe, one of the most powerful courses this institute offers because of what you just did, the role that these adductors and abductors as rotators have on our body. And we forget though, we have that same role in this thing down there called a hole that's got muscle around it that does a bigger job globally than what's going here. This is a smarter region because this area could control that area if it's permitted to. When you're in a long seated or all four position, guess what? You're permitted to. You can do it in that position. Right, because that hole is like a trampoline and allows vibration, which is how these in two things position. communicate. In that yes. position. That position. Well, I love you so much. Thank you for being here. Yes. Well, thank you, everybody. I will say one thing. One of the things that I, I think I listened to you, Jan, talk, and I, I'm rem uh, remiss if I didn't say this. I really think, Jen Smart, we need people to talk about this more. So for all of you listening who do know something about PRI, you know, talk about it with your colleagues. Talk about it with family members. Talk about this, this issue of alternating reciprocality and how big it is in all creatures of life. I mean, it's, it's biology. So the title itself, reciprocal, alternating reciprocal rotation. Those three words, Jen, that's you, that's me, that's, that's how we function. Alternating reciprocal rotation um, has component, componentry everywhere. But the structure that we, the way we design this, to get to that tertiary mindedness, you have to at least appreciate how to equalize mass. And that's what we're trying to do today. I, I just think, I think you're the cat's meow and I want to, Thank you for being here in my life. Absolutely. Um, thank is there you. anything else? Nope. No other questions. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, and thank you for your interest in these webinars. I hope you have a wonderful weekend.